So let's go ahead and introduce our guest. So today we have Ed Blay. Well, I want to thank you guys both for... Yeah, so I'll start that over. I'll, I'll cut it all together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry about <laughs> make, that. Make sure, I, I want to make sure I'm you. saying it right, too, right? Ed Blay. Am I saying your name correct? It's Bly. Bly. Okay. Ed Bly. Bly. Okay, so first yes, we're going to make sure that's out of the way. So with that, we'll introduce our guest today. So, oh, Jesus Christ. There's a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Blooper Central. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, I hope you're following us on social media because you might have seen that t-shirts are finally in. Yes, I know I'm a little behind on schedule, but there's always some hiccups along the way. If you haven't seen the t-shirt, go on Instagram or Twitter and go check it out. It's only for our Patreon supporters, so make sure you sign up and support the show. There's some big news happening this week. We had Dixon Deadman, the man behind Kentucky Owl, back on episode 27, talk about the resurgence of his family's old label. Well, they've now been bought out by the parent company of Stoli Vodka. You can read more about it on thewhiskeywash.com. Also, Woodford Reserve Double Double Oaked is now available as a limited time release at the distillery and some neighboring outlets. And if you remember back on episodes 45 with Chris Morris, the master distiller at Woodford Reserve, he said that this is the best experiment that he had ever released. With that said, make sure you support the show. We've got sponsorships starting at just $1 a month that gets you unedited footage, such as the entire video recording for today's podcast. Make sure you visit patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash bourbon pursuit. Enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit podcast. Kenny and Ryan here today doing another remote interview. Uh, you know, this is this is going to be kind of an interesting one. You know, we've we've talked to, uh, you know, we all have our local store owners. We we all have the local stores we shop at and everything like that. But it's not too often that we have um, somebody that's that's been doing this for a long time and uh, has been doing barrel picks for a long time and has a, a a rich history of bourbon to actually come on the show and kind of talk about. What's unique about their store and what they're doing differently? So uh, first, it's just not me here today, but Ryan's here with me. Hello. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, like you said, I'm, I'm super excited. I love talking to liquor store owners because this day and age as a bourbon hunter, we kind of get pissed off at them. And like, you know, because we're trying to get the bottles that we want and they have, you know, to try to please everyone. So I like to get their side of the story and also talk about barrel picks because especially cork and bottles. Theirs are fantastic. I had a few at your house the other night and uh, they have some really good stuff. So with that, let's introduce our guests today. So today we have Ed Bly. Ed runs the spirits and beer department at cork and bottle that hey, they have a few locations and we'll, we'll dive into that. So Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I much appreciate you guys having me on. So one thing we always want to talk about is kind of give us your history, your past, and kind of what led you to cork and bottle and bourbon and all those great things. You know, it's it's kind of amazing that as I look back at the journey that, that I took getting here and all the things that added into to kind of the lucky situation I fell into into this place. It's amazing. I, I, I was a chef for many, many years. Um, I did uh, high quality dining, culinary arts, went to school for it, really enjoyed it. So flavor and and, uh, and things along that lines were always big in my book. Um, bourbon wasn't so big for a while. You know, I did the college thing, you know, the high school thing where I you know, I drank a bunch of the Jim Beam and the, and the Jack Daniels and things like that. And didn't work out so well for me. And I took several years off on it. Um, and then a buddy of mine gave me a sip of Pappy 15 and I was hooked back again. <laughs> so, so it's been several years. And then I, I went to uh, Texas for a while. And before that, I was a medical assistant for a neurosurgeon. And so the customer service aspect of it kind of helped me there. Um, and through connections, I made uh, running Whiskey Barrel Society. Um, I actually met the former owners of Cork and Bottle. Um, and I, I always did I did pretty well with sales and, and bourbon. I knew, I, you know, I was passionate about it. once I tasted that Pappy 15, I just started learning as much as I possibly could, as fast as I could about it. Um, Cause it excited me and it interested me. Um, got hired on here, starting off just stocking shelves, uh, just, you know, working my way up. And then we went through an ownership change at the store and uh, things were ready to be rebuilt. And so they started leaning on me with the bourbon side because they knew that I really enjoyed it. And I kind of just worked my way up from there. It has been a passion now for several years for me. Uh, 
learning as much as I can about the history and also enjoying the taste and seeing what unique bottles I can find when I go out looking. So I guess when you are out looking, I mean, you, you don't have to go far because you you work at a liquor store, but what are you looking for when you are out looking? I, I'm a dusty guy. I have a long and foremost. I'm, My man. I like that. <laughs> I, I, I have always been a dusty guy. Um, the, that flavor that, you know, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, that, that was in bourbon that you just can't find today. It always captivated me. And so when I go out if looking. You, if I, you talk to Eddie Ru- or Jimmy Russell, he says that we're full of shit. It's like. The stuff it's is just as good today as it was then. I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> you know, Eddie and Jimmy are actually really good friends of mine. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you right up front, Eddie doesn't necessarily agree with Jimmy on now. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yes, sir. But I, I absolutely love that flavor, that that richness, the medicinal, the the, the whole package that went into how rich bourbon was back then is right up my alley. So when I go out looking, I'm looking for stuff you can't find available today. There's things that maybe forgotten store owners have or got pushed back on the shelf or things along that lines. I, I got into the current releases years ago and realized that, yeah, they're great, but they're just not what I I really, really enjoyed. So it's, it's fun. It's a challenge. It's a treasure hunt. And I think that captivated me to go hit a bunch and bunch of bunch of bunch of stores. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that I that is a challenge, especially nowadays when uh, at least around here in Kentucky, pretty much every Dusty's cleared out back in 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah for freaking sure. Bill, Bill Thomas took them all. <laughs> I'd wipe the state clean. <laughs> I, I drove from up here all the way down past Elizabethtown and hit every store between here and there in one day. I ended up hitting 35 stores on that route that day, just to, having a fun day and going out treasure hunting. You know, we well, got it, and that was a uh, spill. Would you find anything? Yeah, yeah. So I did. I mean, I found a bunch of old ancient ages. Um, I found some old Tom Moore bottled in bonds. I found, gosh, there was a ton of stuff on that trip. I found. I ended up buying, that, I think, twenty bottles, twenty five bottles. That Tom Moore bottled in bonds pretty good. I, uh, I got a couple of those. It's fantastic. And the the newer stuff that I found wasn't as good. I got lucky enough and had a sample of a sixty five bonded the other day. Um, and oh my gosh, such a rich bourbon. Barton yeah. really really did a number with that stuff it was amazing i love i love old dusty barton <laughs> <laughs> we might touch back on the dusties here in a little bit um so one of the things that we kind of want to talk about more uh just talk about cork and bottle in, in general you know kind of a yeah. history of of where it is uh, or sorry you know of what it's what it's been um you know a history of bourbon uh, locations all that sort of stuff yeah, sure. No problem. So we've been around now for 52 years. Uh, the store was started in uh, 1965. Um, it's changed locations multiple times since then. But one thing that's always been consistent with Cork and Bottle is the bourbon history. Uh, the Hughes were, were owners for a very long time and did a great job uh, with some of the past picks that, that, that were here. I mean, my gosh, the history on our picks is just mind blowing. We've done Van Winkle picks. We've done Private Barrel Elmers. We were doing Old Weller Antiques back as early as 05. And uh, it's just amazing the history and the bottles that have come out of this place. And I, still to this day, I see bottles I've never even known that we've done. And some of the pallets that picked barrels here back in those days are, were just amazing. Um, the, the Van Winkles, for instance, and, and the Private Barrel Willets that we did and Golly, it's just so, so many. So we went through some changes, though. Um, the Hughes have, have, uh, have decided to uh, try a different adventure, and we're owned by a different family now, a uh, different investment group, and, and built back up and going strong. But we only do have one location right now. Uh, we sold that other location down in Covington a few years ago. But you never know what the future is going to hold for us. Um, we're doing our best to, to kind of reinvent what a liquor store is. There's a lot of stores that, that, that are either so small, they don't have everything you need, or so big, they can't give you the personal touch. And one thing that we focus on here is definitely connecting with our customers. Um, we're not too big to where we can't know everybody by name, or and we're not too small to where we can't carry all the products everybody wants. We're comfortably right in the middle. Um, and so it's it's been an adventure over the past. I've been here now for going on two years. Um the past two years have been reinventing what cork and bottle was because we, we were one of the absolute 
biggest liquor stores in the U S back in the sixties. Um, and, uh, and over all the way through the seventies, the, the amount of, the amount of product that was moved through these stores and the amount of, amount of bottles that just came out of here are just mind blowing. Um, so I had big shoes to fill when I started doing our barrel picks here. Uh, I mean, how do you follow up with a Van Winkle 20 year private select? <laughs> you know, you just can't, you don't see that stuff anymore. So I got to make do with what I got and do the best I can at finding unique things that are available today. And I think we've done pretty well with that. Um, so talk about, so I, I'll, I'll, go ahead. One, thing, one thing we missed there is where's this, the specific location uh, where it's, where it resides today. Sh- sure. No problem. We're at 584 buttermilk Pike in Crescent Springs, Kentucky, which is up by Cincinnati. Um, we're about uh, about ten minutes from Cincinnati and about mm, about an hour north of, of Lexington, on seventy five. Great. So let's yeah. go ahead and, and kind of talk a, a little bit just on you know because you said so right now Cork and Bottle is just the one store is that correct? Correct. Yes, sir. So kind of talk about what it means to to kind of be a, an independent one store, um, you know, kind of shop, uh, you know, shopping small and, and the importance that that really brings to, to the local communities and stuff like that as well. It's uh, it's definitely, it's, it's an ongoing struggle on our end sometimes to help people understand because they look at a, a bottle, maybe being a dollar more at our store as opposed to a big, huge chain store. And I, I, I try to explain to people how important it is to actually shop local because that supports jobs in our community. It supports our community. Um, all of our stuff stays in our community, if you will. Um, we do the best we can at, uh, at, at definitely um, pushing that thought to people. Uh, being local and being small and still struggling to, to, to compete with the giant guys that are not, you know, able to buy the huge case deals and blow margins out at super low costs. That seems like a great idea when you're buying, but all you're doing is killing jobs around the area and not supporting your local community because all that money goes away. It goes out of state. You know, yeah, a lot of a lot of liquor stores here are having that problem with Total Wine moving in. So a lot of the independents are struggling to keep up with yep. them. And, and so it, and how can they compete or how do you guys try to compete, you know, with these big players? When we've thought about that, and you know, Total Wine will be coming up into our market here probably um, within the next year, year and a half or so, um, I'd imagine. And, and we've had to game plan a little bit for it. But the, the truth of the matter is, is customers still come to see us regardless. I've noticed that, you know, when we're dealing with the other big uh, chain stores that are up this way, and there are some really, really big stores up here, I still have customers that come to us because of our personal touch. And because of the selections we're doing with our bourbon and because and because of the atmosphere of our store when you come in. Um, yeah, we may be a dollar higher, but that's OK. And that's just because we're local and we're not a big, huge chain that's taking your money out of state. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is a constant struggle and allocations, getting the, the amount of allocations as much as I possibly can for my customers is an everyday struggle. But it's one I take on will, willingly, you know. I knew I knew the situation I was getting into when I took this job and I knew what I would be struggling against uh, dealing with the bigger stores. And that's OK, because what they don't what they can't offer is that personal touch. You can't come in and, and try a sample of a bottle before you buy. You can't come in and, and, and get to know the people and talk to the staff for, you know, as much time as you want. We, we love our customers here and it shows because they keep coming back. They keep coming back regardless. I, I think, think that's that, important. I think that personal touches is, is also something that kind of we want to kind of harp on a little bit more because I, I've seen, you know, you can read in forums and uh, firsthand accounts of people that go into these large chains and they say, they'll say, oh, I'm looking for a, a new bourbon. I, I want something that's, um, you know, whether it's a high rye or it's uh, uh, this price point or whatever it is. And they'll say, oh, you could look at this or you can go and look at this house brand that we have. And it seems right. that most of them are trying to push their house brands because, uh, you know, they get it at and super, more super margin. low margins. Right. And yeah. so it might not be something that, that you would have in an independent store where they're essentially trying to, you know, have a choice of, you know, one of the, the, the main stakes that are actually out there. Right. And that's true. There's uh, there's definitely house brands that are out there and there's definitely people that really don't care much or know much about bourbon that will push it on to you. Um, the one thing that you can get definitely here every time is honesty. That that was one of my biggest challenges coming into here is is that I want people to be able to trust us 
So I don't lie to customers. If I got bottles in the back and they're asking for them, and I'll tell them right up front, listen, you know, we do have those bottles. We're not selling them right now because we're using them for other projects later on. Don't, we'll get them in your hands. So stay tuned. You know, um, I, I go out of my way to always tell the truth to our customers, even if it's something that's not necessarily going to be what they want to hear. That doesn't uh, happen around here. No. <laughs> Every time I go to that spot, they're like, fuck you, get the fuck out. No. Yeah. And see, I had, I had that. I Why had, are you bothering me? <laughs> how, where's the pappy hiding? You know, how many times do I hear that? I had a guy come in the other day and asking for a William Lou Weller. He said, I hear it's kind of hard to find. <laughs> you know, and I get that daily and I get why people get frustrated about that, about being asked that. But to me, if that person cares enough to come into my store to look for something, I'm still going to make him feel special. I'm still going to do everything I can to make his experience positive with our store. And uh, I think that's lost in a lot of the stores that are out there. I've had the advantage of standing on the other side of the counter for many years long before I ever worked here. So I kind of knew the frustrations walking in of, of people that love this stuff and want to get it and, and want to do everything they can to find that bottle and only to have their dreams crushed by somebody being a jerk to them. Yeah, so, so you don't get burned out on people coming and saying, where's the Pappy in June, you know, like no, in July? I don't know, just because I know that that person probably isn't that big in the bourbon that they don't understand. So what I do is I try to educate them a little bit and help them and save them a little time on their looks, but give them some viable alternatives that, you know, aren't necessarily as limited, but but probably drink pretty daggone good in comparison, Yeah, you know. So like that's... That. That's what I try to do um, with our with our allocated items. I'll tell you right up front, they all go to our customers. I've uh, I've only been fortunate enough to purchase one bottle from our store, and that bottle was sent to me specifically by one of the head ups of my uh, of, of my reps specifically for me. Other than that, I put it in y'all's hands, um, and we put it at a retail in your guys' hands. And that's that's a huge thing to me. I'm not one of those stores that's going to go out there and gouge ridiculous numbers just because it says Van Winkle on the bottle. It's not fair. You know, I, I could make an extra hundred bucks, 100, 200, 300 bucks on that bottle. But you know what? The amount of customers that I would lose by doing that would cost me 10 times as much. It's just silly. So, yeah, being frustrated uh, as a bourbon hunter on my end, I, that's one of the things that we made sure we do on our end is sell our bottles at retail. So, right, so we, we do do a that is that is always one thing Sorry. you know we've actually had people always chime in and they say like you know have have a store owner come on and kind of talk about allocated releases you know and that's kind of one thing that i'm trying to do my best for 2017 is not to always talk about allocated bourbon because that's what kind of starts the starts the craziness to begin with but i think sure. while we have you on it's 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 always good to kind of get that perspective so yeah, yeah i mean I, I i love the fact that you you know you put it in the customer's hands you don't you don't charge an outrageous amount because of uh, the adverse effects. Now, why is it that you don't go to a lottery system? Because a lot of places and a lot of people feel that, and this, I am not one of those people that feel that a, a lottery system is, is the most fair because it gives everybody an, an equal opportunity. That's exactly what we do. Um, it wasn't, we weren't the first store to ever do that. But what I do is I take those allocated items like uh, like the Van Winkles and the Four Roses Limiteds and things along that lines, and I'll put them in a case in our store, and people can come in our store and fill out an entry to get in that raffle. And at the same time, what that does is that puts a person in front of me that gives me an opportunity to let them try our store picks. We have a full tasting license here. So I give them I give them samples of our store picks and I talk to them about which bar bourbon they purchased out of the case if they were winner, if they were lucky enough to win. Um, and we do that twice a month, year round, all year long. We do a full lottery system and it's completely fair. It's videotaped, put on Facebook. So people know that what we're doing is on the up and up. We try to be very, very transparent. Now, obviously that lottery is not going to take uh, every single one of the bottles that we get in our allocated items. So we, we take a little twist on things and I do things like our hide and seeks that we do in our store, which is so much fun. Um, we take I some like of the, that. We take some of our bottles and we will hide them periodically throughout the store behind bottles on the shelves and then we'll post it. And within 20 minutes, there's a thundering herd that comes running through the door and everybody's looking up and down on the shelves trying to find these bottles that they want to buy. And what's really great, the best part about this whole thing is the customers that are just normally shopping in the store when this happens and don't know what's going on. <laughs> they see a flood of people and they're like, what the hell? Yeah, that's exactly it. And we're sitting back cracking up watching this whole thing go down and everybody's having fun. And that's that's one thing we try to do here on our end is, is push the boundaries on what's been done and, and try to figure out new ways to be creative and have fun and engage our customers. Um, for instance, like although we have a we have a cook off coming up that'll be on uh, February 18th where 
to get in the cook off, I do is register and then you cook anything you want to cook with one of our store pick bourbons. And there's only 30 spots. So there'll be 30 spots set up around the store and we'll have people come in and the crowd will judge who wins. And that person that wins will get a right to buy a 20 year Van Winkle. And the second place will, will get a right to buy a, a lot B and the third place will get to buy a, um, a, a, a rip Van Winkle and they're all at retail. So they're not gouging and everybody has a blast doing it. So that's, that's one of the things we try to do just to engage all of our customers and keep things fun. That's, you know, we've been, that's definitely an interesting approach. And I, I like the, the cookout thing. I, I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, I love my green egg back here. I could I could whip up something on there and have it be yeah. ready for 14 hours <laughs> driving on up there. But um, the, uh, the other thing with that is like, well, how do you stop the people that are there to just get it and flip it? Like, how do you, how do you stop the people that are um, just there to, they, they stop in every day and fill out a, fill out a thing for the lottery yet. They, they never buy anything in the store. You know, I don't normally have that issue because, again, we're not so big that people can just walk in, fill out an entry and leave without somebody recognizing them and engaging them and saying hi and, and giving them the personal touch. And, you know, some people do come in to do that. And if that's the case, that's the way it is. You know, I, I can't uh, unfortunately, I can't make everybody happy, but I do my best to make most people happy. Um, and if you got flippers that come in here, then that's the case. You know, I guess. You know, that they can get away with it. Good for them. Um, me personally, I like sharing stuff with people. So not only do I share our store picks, but occasionally we'll have a couple special bottles here for them to try as well, just to give them a chance to try something they haven't had before. But stopping the flippers, I mean, that's that's been that's impossible. I don't I don't think there's really a way to do that. Um, we do our best just to just to recognize the people that are here and keep them coming back and keep them trying things. And sometimes you can convert them too. So I, mean, I, mean, I, think, I guess, I guess, you know, you've talked about a few different ways. So do you have, um, you know, you, you, so you have your, your lottery, then you've also got your, your other kind of fun games like the hide and seek. Now, do you also take care of those people that are going in there and uh, spending money, you know, yeah. every, yeah. every week in the store as well? Yeah, for sure. So there's a, there's a difference between an ultra limited product and allocated product and an everyday product. So with Buffalo Trace, for instance, everything is allocated. Every single thing that they do is allocated. They're the only distillery that tells me exactly what I'm going to buy from them every year. And there's not a daggone thing I can do to stop it. Um, Ohio found that out last year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so what I do is I take those mid-tier products like the Elmer Tea Leaves and the Weller Antiques and the Weller Special Reserves and the Rock Hill Farms. And I'll sit on them for a little bit. And in the meantime, if I got somebody that I, that I know that comes in and shops with us all the time and they say, hey, Ed, I'm really looking for this specific bottle I'm out or I, I want to give it to my father or something like that. And it's not something that necessarily is going to run out the door and be flipped like an Elmer or a Rock Hill farm or something like that. And I know the customer, I'll toss them one of those bottles. No problem. But usually what we do is I'll save all those cases. And uh, a couple times throughout the year, instead of and, and the way I look at it, it's like this, I could put those six bottles on the shelf and make six people happy and then completely piss off 150 other people that are looking for that same thing. Or I save that case in the back and we sit on it and then we put them all out at one time with a limit one per person so that, you know, 50 people have a chance at it as opposed to six. And I think that I think our customers actually appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I say that because it gives everybody a shot at it. So we use those mid tier bottles a little bit to, to help our customers that, that come in frequently and that kind of stuff. But you'd be shocked because most of the people that come in frequently are coming here looking for our picks. You know, when Smooth Ambler announced the other day that they were going to stop doing private picks, no kidding, I had 25 people come in that day looking for our private barrel Smooth Ambler. <laughs> and, I, and my phone blew up all day. People asking if we were sold out. People asking if we were sold out. So I had a few bottles left, and what we're going to do is – I was going to say, are you those. sold out? That's the big point. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I tell them, I say, no, you know, we're not sold out. We have a few, but we're going to use those for events later on in the year because people are going to be wanting those picks later in the year, and they're just not going to be around. You know, nobody's going to have an opportunity at them. So what are we going to do? So we use them as as uh, as draws, if you will, and do some something around with them, some sort of event, I'm sure. So it'll be fun. Well, cool. So let's let's kind of stay on the topic of, of barrel picks a little bit. Sure. Uh, kind of talk about, you know, what you guys have got coming up and, and some of those kind of things. And and I guess I guess a good a good reason and a good way we have you on here is. Uh, talk about the process. Like, how do you get selected to go and choose a barrel? Like, how does 
you know, everybody kind of knows that in Kentucky, you have to go through a distributor. You have to go through a liquor store to be able to do a barrel pick. But that's correct. kind of talk about the process that happens behind the scenes. Does uh, do, you, do you call up, you know, your, your good friends at Buffalo Trace and say, hey, we want to do this. And they say, well, guess what? You're two millionth in line, you know, get in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that works it, it, on our end is pretty, uh, pretty cut and dry. Um, Buffalo Trace, for instance, they're going to tell me again how many barrels and exactly which barrels I'll be able to buy this year. So we'll go down there and we'll pick from the barrels and be able to take the allotment that w- that we were all allotted this year or allocated. Um, but other distilleries are different. Uh, when we did Smooth Ambler, for instance, that was a great trip, and, and those guys are completely different. So they don't put a cap on how many you can try. Um, I call, I contacted them and I said, Hey, Johnny, where are we at on the list? And, you know, I want to schedule a time to come see you. And he'll either say, yeah, we still got a bunch of guys ahead of you or, or, you know, can you be here on this date? And we'll go down there. That was one of my favorite trips to go on just because they don't limit you. So I, I'd go out there with Paul Jackson into the, into the barrel room and we would drill barrels until we found something that, <laughs> that made on. us happy. <laughs> and you know, this last trip we went on, we were actually not only picking for our store, but like you were mentioning, three groups were running barrels through our store. Uh, and then we've also picked for uh, uh, another store down in your area, down in Lake, well, not too far from me, down in Lexington, uh, Go Big Blue Liquors. Uh, they had, one of their guys was uh, on our trip with us. So we ended up selecting eight barrels, but we, drilled 27 to find those eight and i think at that point johnny was ready to kick us out (laughs) (laughs) but we did we found some absolute winners and it just really depends on the distillery so when i contact my rep and say hey look i want to go do a heaven hill pick or i want to go do uh, a wild turkey pick i'll contact my rep first they'll let me know what dates are available and we'll schedule it right away um so far i know I've got coming up here. You asked which ones we have coming. We have a Maker's 46 cash strength that we just found out is going to be delayed a little bit. Um, but uh, I also have a private barrel 15 year Knob Creek um, that's going to sell out instantly. And then uh, a Russell's Reserve I picked with Eddie on my 40th birthday, November 23rd. That was fantastic. One of the best Russell's I've tasted. So when those three are coming up, I've got uh, picks scheduled at 1792 to do a full proof. I got picks scheduled at Buffalo Trace to pick a couple old Weller antiques, uh, an Eagle Rare, and a Buffalo Trace barrel. And r- rather than break those barrels up this year, I decided just to do them all at one time. Um, it's hard telling people that are every day coming in the store looking for old Weller antique that you had a barrel, but it sold out in three hours, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So so we're going to do both of them at the same time. And hopefully that'll spread it out a little bit more for folks and give everybody a chance at a bottle on it. I guess Um, talk, talk about some of the experiences, like, uh, you know, some of the more, you know, you gave us the one with the smooth ambler and, you know, drilling through 27 barrels, but kind of talk about some more of those experiences of, of going out and picking something. Oh goodness. There's, there's always a story to tell after each pick. It's absolutely amazing. And that's, I think that's part of the driving force behind the bottles. So I went down uh, to wild Turkey on my, on my 40th birthday, November 23rd. And I went down there and, and Eddie knew I was coming down on my birthday. I talked to Eddie. He's a great guy. Absolutely great guy. And the guys all at wild Turkey are all fantastic, but I, I don't know. Eddie and I get along really, really well. And I, I get out of my car and Eddie walks out and I meet Eddie and he's saying, how you doing? And I say, Eddie, and he says, before you ask, he says, Campari just flat out won't let me do it. He knew I wanted one of those rye barrels so bad. I've been, <laughs> I've been bugging him for a year now for one of those rye barrels. So I uh, hope I'm on the list to do that. But one of the neat things I kind of figured out uh, at Wild Turkey was is that after you taste, you know, 10, 10 Kentucky Spear barrels and eight or 10 Russell Reserve barrels. They all kind of, you forget which ones were the ones that jumped out with you. So my first trip down there, I had a pocket full of change. And as I realized what was going on, on the barrels I was interested in, I'd just leave a coin on it. Uh, just so I remember go back and try and blind again to pick the right ones, which barrel, you know, I just don't want to screw up. Because one thing I've learned about doing barrel picks is no matter what you're doing, you're playing with a gosh awful amount of somebody else's money it's yeah. somebody, and it's a lot you know we did those barrels in smooth ambler i mean golly you're over 50 grand for those barrels that's a that's somebody's you know a mm-hmm. lot of somebody's money so i gotta make sure i'm right on point with what i'm doing on our picks so i put coins out there 
and, and I didn't realize at first. I think Eddie was walking around picking them up behind. Me. <laughs> He's like, "Ooh, spare change." <laughs> yeah. He goes, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm just trying to keep track of what is going on." So we went back and put all the coins back, and, and ended up doing a pick that way. But he still tells everybody about that. I know there was a group that just went down there last weekend, and they messaged me after they picked. They said Eddie was talking all back and forth about all this change that you carry in your pocket. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it I was like that. A, a fun, fun trip. But you know. When I go to do these picks, I got to make sure that one, I'm not getting buzzed because I'm playing with so much of somebody else's money. And the last thing in the world I want to do is be drunk and do something stupid. So I have a method that I use when I pick barrels to where I'll start with the nose. If the nose is there, then great. We'll go on to the taste and see how the taste is there. And if the, the taste isn't there, I'll go on to the next one and start the process over again. So I'm not necessarily drinking 27 barrels, but I'm drilling them, checking them out, going through the process. It's important to me being a food guy, a big foodie and a former, and, you know, former culinary arts guy that, that the nose, the nose sets everything up. If the nose isn't there, it doesn't matter how great it tastes. It's not going to taste as good as it could have. And, and it all starts with the nose, that bouquet. And so kind of talk a little bit more about that, because I, I think it, that it's interesting to kind of hear about your background and like how you how you either trained your palate or how you got your palate into a way to be able to um discern different flavors, be able to say this is a better barrel than the next. So when I first got into bourbon, I got real excited. And the first thing I started doing was tasting absolutely everything I could taste. I've been very, very, very fortunate in the bourbon community and met so many wonderful people that samples of something that I've never had are usually not a, not a problem. I can usually find something. So as I went through there, I started developing my palate and, and what I enjoyed about bourbon and, and the things that I look for. And I, I absolutely love rich bourbon, the rich, rich bourbon with an easy heat finish, but a long flavor finishes right up my alley. Um, so a, as I went through and I've tasted all these things, I started noticing things I liked about certain bottles and things that, that, that kind of put me off a little bit. Um, and, and, I I just developed what I liked. And so when I pick barrels and I take people with me, um, we generally just pick the things we would want to drink. And if it's something that I really am excited about, we're taking it for sure. You know, and, and I think you, you guys have both had a chance to try a couple of our picks now and you kind of see what I'm talking about. Yeah. And Ed, and Ed, we trust. <laughs> yeah, that nose the nose sets everything up it's kind of like looking at a plate of food this is how i explain it to people when you go to a restaurant if everything's just slapped on a plate and it's not appetizing to look at it's not going to taste as good so if it's arranged nicely on a plate and it's a clean nice presentation you're excited about trying it i think the nose is your plate presentation the nose sets you up if it smells awesome and your mouth starts watering just by smelling it, you're going to go ahead and jump right in and be excited about what's coming next. And if I did my job right on the picking, then uh, then I know that you're going to enjoy it. And again, the great thing about our store is that you get the opportunity to try it before you buy it. We have a full tasting license. You come in, you say, I hear you got a new pick. I want to try it. And we're pouring it for you instantly. It's not an issue. And I, I think that speaks volumes about the, the confidence that you have in the products that you're putting out uh, to represent your store. And I think a lot of store guys are, are missing that by by just randomly sending customers down there and trusting them to pick your, your barrels for you. There's definitely a lot of stores that do that. Um, and what they come out with, not always so great. Yeah, it's not I always think so great. that's definitely an interesting thing because yeah. there's, there's a few stores around us that, you know, you'll get an email and it says like, uh, you know, the first five people to respond and, uh, you know, pay a hundred dollars for lunch and bus fare, get the opportunity to go and choose a barrel for our next barrel pick. And it's an, it's an interesting idea to be able to say like, Oh, let's give other people the opportunity to go do this. But I also think as, as you kind of mentioned, like you need to have somebody there that knows what the hell they're doing. Right. Because yeah. you're going to get a bunch of people that, uh, honestly, for the most of this, they're going to be drinking straight from the barrel, barrel proof bourbon, um, and they've got to understand that this is going to be uh, cut at 110 or it's going to be bottled at barrel proof or it's going to be chill filtered. Like it's going to affect the flavor at the end of this oh. after the for, for the final product. So um, kind of talk about those those sort of variables and how that plays into it 
when you're tasting sure. as well. So, well, first, so just so you know, I always take customers with me when we go down and I'll take different customers. I try to do different customers on each pick just to give everybody the experience of going. Um, but yeah, you're exactly right. So to, to hit on exactly what you were saying, we went to Buffalo Trace last year and, and they rolled out some old Weller antique barrels. They rolled out some Eagle Rare barrels. They rolled out some Buffalo Trace barrels and we tried all of them. And the group that we took down with us um, wasn't necessarily, I wouldn't say that they're bourbon aficionados. They knew what they liked, but they, they didn't know all the intricacies of it. So when we were tasting at Barrel Strength, I always, if I know it's going to get proofed down, it's not hard to do the calculations to know how much water to, to add to it to see how it's going to hold up. You know, if it's going to be, if it's going down 10% from where your barrel is right now, you get 5% water to your glass, and, and that'll give you an idea of where it's going to be at. So we were tasting through these Eagle Rare barrels, and uh, and I knew right away which one I was interested in, but everybody else was on a different one. And, I, and we started tasting them, and uh, and I proofed it down, and they were all still drinking at barrel strength, and, and I'm going, oh, my gosh, this barrel is just so amazing. And they're going, we want this other barrel. And I, and I say, okay. I said, but here, try this. And I to let them taste down the proof down glass, and then I to proof down the one that they tried and, and that they all liked, and the – the glass that they had all liked had virtually no flavor at all. And the glass that I proofed down was still holding up strong. And that ended up being the 11 year Eagle rare barrel that we picked last year that everybody has gone nuts over. I actually just had a pour of that barrel last night, uh, that bottle. And it, it's amazing how crazy that, that barrel was. It, it literally smells like old Weller antique, but it's Eagle rare. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just so mind blowing. It's a trip. But yeah, you're exactly right. If you don't, if you don't proof it down, if you don't try it, try it at a lower proof to see how it holds up to proofing, you, you're going in blind. You have no idea what you just picked because everything you do to bourbon changes it. Every single thing, you know, it's amazing. Maybe you can give a, a shed a little bit more information or light on this. And, you know, it could be easy as just saying, well, uh, the TTB or the parrot companies don't allow us to do this. But, you know, when you are going, you, you try a, a barrel proof version of, of Eagle Rare. Well, why can't you just say, guys, like, don't cut this. Like, don't chill filter it. Like, we want it exactly as it is out of the barrel. It depends on the distillery. Um, Any more of these distilleries are all run by big corporations. So uh, most of the, most of the distilleries, let me, let me rephrase that. Most of the big distilleries <laughs> are run by corporations and those corporations to get anything different done is, is a giant pain in the took us. I really, I, I can't explain to you how good Eagle rare is at barrel proof. And, and if you've never had the opportunity to try it, find a way because that stuff is probably one when of you the, call Bo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah call Bo. Down there. Yeah, Bo <laughs> give me a sample. Cause that stuff at barrel proof is my, one of my favorite Buffalo trace products, but they force you to proof it down. And that's because they will, don't want to have to keep changing their program up every time somebody comes in to pick something. The other problem they have is that they had flocking occurring in their bottles that were non-chill filtered. Um, so they were having customers send bottles back that they thought was something wrong with them. Well, you know, there's not, it's just the oil congealed. So I do is shake it, but that's why the old Weller antiques, they won't let stores do them um, non-chill filtered where they'll let private groups go down there and pick a barrel of old Weller antique and, and, and do it non-chill filtered. Hopefully that'll change in the future. Um, I've been pushing as hard as I can from my end to, to make that happen. Uh, the same situation is true with Kentucky spirit. Uh, I wish to goodness they quit chill filtering that. And I have gone as far as calling Campari and saying, guys, listen to your customers. We want it non chill filtered. There's a reason for that. And, and sometimes when you're dealing with corporations, the answer you get is, well, our quality control team thinks it'll hurt the quality of the bourbon. And I'm going, you need a new quality control team. <laughs> you know? it's like, or, that's the most absurd them, thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, or you tell them like, wait, we're the ones buying it, right? Not, not right. you all. So you should just give it to us how we want it. I mean, if, if yeah, that, that's, that's kind of blows my mind because I think in addition of being able to have a characteristics of a, of a barrel proof Russell's reserve or barrel proof Eagle rare or whatever it is and having it non shell filtered, I think it also, sets it aside and makes it a lot more unique than just the regular stuff off the shelves. Right. And I agree completely. Yeah. And, and it, and it provides that, that level of uniqueness that is more than just a sticker on the side of the bottle. Correct. And it definitely does. So the challenge now is to be able to work within the parameters that I'm allowed to work within at the distilleries and still be able to come up with such a unique bottle that, that it stands out. 
and that's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. They they kind of handicap you there a little bit, but uh, I think we've done pretty well with that. I do you ever have problems with customers saying, "I know I do barrel picks for a buddy of mine in your stores," and customers will say, "Oh, well, you have four rows of single barrel right here that's cheaper." You know, it's and it's the same thing, and then you try to explain to them, and that but they don't believe you. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's definitely uh, one of the one of the byproducts of the bourbon boom is, is that there's a lot of armchair experts out there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you, you are going to run into people and you kind of just have to smile, shake their hand, thank them for coming in. If they don't understand it, let them buy what they want. One thing I will never do is tell somebody they're buying uh, uh, something terrible and, uh, and, and they shouldn't drink that. They should drink this instead. People drink what they like. They drink it how they like it. And they drink exactly the product they want to drink. The only thing I do is just give them other options. So if they take my advice, great, more power to you. If you want to keep and stay and keep with what you know and trust and love, then we got it too. Well, you know, from the couple not, we've had, I'm, they should listen to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> but that's the advantage of having a tasting license and letting people try it because it doesn't take much convincing when they try that kind of stuff and it blows them away. But, uh, you know, there are people that still, we still sell a crap ton of Kentucky Tavern. I'll tell you what, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's Kenny's old staple. Yeah, there you go. Now you're, yeah. now you're talking about me. That's so funny. I, speaking of Dusty, I just bought a, uh, an Owensboro bottle of Kentucky Tavern not too long ago. So that's, oh, I saw that. Ooh. Yeah. How about it? Ooh. I'll be over. Um, tonight. That's awesome. <laughs> so anyway, we're kind of, kind of in here. We'll, we'll wrap it up. And I kind of want to uh, finish it off with one more question because, you know, you said that, you know, sure. everybody's in the business of sales and you have a tasting bar. Uh, talk about a time when you when you've killed a sale of somebody that said like, oh, I'm going to get this. And have you ever said like, no, like you should try this some, this instead? I do that all the time. Um, and I do that through tasting. So I say, you know, that's a great product. But why don't you try one of these picks while you're here? And I give them a little sample and, and we start talking about it. And I explain to them why I picked the barrel. I'm going to tell you right now, the story sells the bottle as equally as much as the product on the inside. So when you tell somebody a story and they're sampling it and you're explaining to them the process and you tell them about Eddie picking up your change off the barrels and, and you tell them about how much fun you had down there and, and show them the pictures on your phone on the pick and they're tasting it the whole time, then they're involved they're captivated they, they understand the story behind it and they have something to tell their buddies about but on the on the same side the stuff inside the bottle is fantastic so they absolutely love it so yeah i can't tell you how many bottles i have to put back on the shelf because they end up picking up one of our store picks instead it, it happens all the time it's not, it, it's not a bad thing to happen though at least you're making no. a sale at the end of the day right yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> and you're making somebody happy and that's 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 a part about the business i absolutely love the most it, it is the personal touch and it's making somebody feel special and making their day and if you can do that and still make a profit in the end of the day you're, you're having a good day and i absolutely love it awesome I'm, I'm ed i'm glad we could have you on today because whenever you are able to get your hands on a especially pick bottle from cork and barrel, you know, it, it really, it ranks up there with some of those ones that you would have from uh lock and key society of Julio's that happens to be in Northeast or, um, yeah. you know, some of those other ones that are in California that, that everybody loves as well. So uh, definitely very happy to have you on the show today and uh, you know, be able to, you know, sample as well from, from some of your picks is at the same exact time. Awesome. Well, listen guys, I really appreciate you having me on and please enjoy those bottles even more. Give them time to open. You're going to love them. I'm telling you. <laughs> so for anybody else that uh, wants to get in touch with you and they want to buy your picks, uh, make sure they understand that we live in Kentucky, which means we're not legally allowed to ship them to you and take a, take your number of the credit card. So kind of kind of spell that information and, and how they can actually get their hands on a bottle if they want to. Um, best thing to do is to either come in the store. Again, we're at 584 Buttermilk Pike in Crescent Springs, 41017. Or give us a call at 859-341-9600. Um, one more time, it's 859-341-9600. And uh, we'll do our best to reserve you a bottle or, or do what we can to help you out. Okay. There awesome. you go. So now you know how to do it. That's uh, right. Sir. Yep, Ed, thank you again for coming on the show. If you like what you hear, make sure you support the show on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Follow us on those great social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Bourbon Pursuit. And, uh, and Ryan, close us out, man. Yeah, thanks, Ed, again. That's awesome. I love talking to liquor stores and just hearing about, you know, how they deal with allocations and trying to provide that touch of service that these big chains just can't do. And 
I also thank you for sharing the process of barrel picks. That's one of my favorite things I've ever done. And I, I envy you because I wanted, I would wish I could do that every day. It's like one of the coolest things, experiences ever. Well, so. we got a bunch of them coming up, so I don't see why you guys shouldn't meet me at one of them. And we'll do one together. Ooh, now we're talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'll definitely make that happen. No problem. I'll keep in touch with you and let you know when the next ones are coming. Let's do Sweet. it. Let's throw awesome. It'll be the good. best bottle you've ever put. Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Maybe we could throw our own custom bird pursuit sticker on the side of it too. I yeah, don't see awesome. why not. <laughs> I can see you and Kenny button heads though on which one to pick. No, this one's it. No, that one's it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm sure it'll all work out just fine. <laughs> oh yeah. That sounds fun. So we'll definitely make that happen. Good deal. So Ryan, close awesome. us out. Yeah, guys, uh, once again, thanks. And uh, if you have any show suggestions or feedback, comments, we'd love to hear from you guys uh, so we can improve on the show and get the guests that you want to hear. So uh, just let us know anytime and we'll keep the content coming and we'll see you next time. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey, and for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com. Mm-hmm.